Debbie Atek. I'm a Bering Straits Native Corporation shareholder and a portfolio specialist for Skyview Investment Advisors. Welcome to this series of interviews I'm doing to explore the economic opportunity and challenges for business development in Alaska. Today we're talking about energy. The total energy demand in Alaska is lower than the national average, but the state's geography makes it incredibly expensive. People in rural communities can pay up to five times the national average for electricity. For example, the average American household uses about 867 kilowatt hours per month and pays about 13 cents per kilowatt hour. At AVEC, one of Alaska's electric cooperatives, their average consumer pays 56 cents per kilowatt hour, so about $480 a month, but there are people who pay as much as $600 for their electric. Melissa Kukesh is chairwoman of Kutsnuwu Inc. and is spearheading the hydroelectric project uh, in Angoon, the Angoon Thayer Project. This project will provide heat to the three schools in Angoon and 130 households. I had the pleasure of being teamed up with Melissa to promote her project and others like it to Senator Murkowski and her staff, who are committed to developing alternative energy solutions in Alaska. I'm happy to have Melissa here to talk about in energy infrastructure projects. Melissa, thanks for being here. So tell Thank us you, about Dana. tell us about yourself. Well, like you said, my name is Melissa Kukash, and I'm the board chair for Kutsnu Incorporated, and it's a position I've held for over four years. I am also Koyukon Athabaskan, Clinkett, and Mexican. My mother is Lena Woods, and my father is the late Floyd Kukash, and we. Um, um, Kutsnu Inc. is the village corporation for the community of Angoon, and Angoon is located in southeast Alaska on Admiralty Island, and year-round we have roughly 450 um, residents in Angoon. Um, in the 1980s, when they did the passage of Anilka, Congress granted Angoon the um, rights to develop Thayer Creek Hydro Project. Um, um, in, in the 1980s, Congress granted our corporation the right to develop Thayer Creek Hydroelectric Project under ANILCA in exchange for the establishment of the island to become a national monument. And um, basically, they were given, they had given our community a coupon to develop a $20 million project. And and our, and I, and I only recently found out about this through a friend who was telling me about the testimony that our elders had provided when they were talking about the history of Angoon, the true history, and you know from the Clinket um, perspective. And so they were wanting, they wanted Angoon to be protected, and that was the the, the reason that they um, did this exchange. And I love this. Just, I love yeah. this story, <laughs> and that is recorded, right? Yes, it is recorded, and I have yet to find out where it has been recorded, but we have our elders from a long time ago telling the history of the Angoon people and how we came to be in this area, and, and it's all, you know, it's all documented, and, and so I think it would be perfect for, you know, our library um, of, of history, and yes. it's yes. really important. I'm more and more committed to making sure that our cultures are documented and preserved. Mm -hmm. It's, it's vital for our young people to understand where they come from, who they are and how they are related to the land. So this sounds like a really good and important interview. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely, um, I know he has committed to me that he would give me, you know, the leads on where I need to look and, but it's definitely, um, definitely um, very meaningful and impactful because I've had the opportunity to hike around Angoon this summer during COVID and, and we've taken, you know, people who are culture bearers with us on these hikes and they've told us like the history, you know, of these forts that our, our Clinket people had. And so when, oh when I heard, yeah, when I heard that, that history and then had the, the history from my friend, you know, about how, Admiralty Island came to be a national monument. I was just, 
uh, it, just putting the pieces together has just been a very fun experience. I love that. So let's talk a little bit more about your project then and what it's going to do or what it is doing. Um, tell us where you're at in the project and uh, what, what it means to Angoon. Um, so for the engineers out there, um, this project, it would be um, just north of here, north of Angoon, um, on the other side, because we have this, this body of water that separates, and you can see the tide go in and out, and right on the other side of that, um, we recently discovered that we own this land. Um, our, the people who came before me, they bought pieces, and so we have this big piece of land where the, the hydro is going to be. And, and it's six miles north, and they, um, it's, it's on their creek, and it's, there's going to be a 19-foot tall diversion structure, um, 850 kilowatt, generator, kilowatt generators located near the Barrier Falls. There will be a power line that will go from Angoon, um, that will run to Angoon um, along um, a 6.2-mile road. Um, with a barge landing at the end, and then it will cross under this body of water that I spoke about because that runs in and out, um, connecting to the town's current structure. Gotcha. And, um, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and the other great thing about it is that the project has received favorable um, final EIS. Um, I was going to ask you about that. Yes. I've been thinking yes. about that as, as it's become, uh, we've gotten closer to uh, our talk today, I've been thinking about the environmental and particularly the impact on um, any uh, animals, fish in particular. Yes. And, and so the record, we've also received the record of decision from the U.S. Forest Service and FERC has ruled that the project is, is exempt from FERC licensing. And one of the other things that we recently discovered in talking with um, one of our other arms for the corporation is that it's a great bear viewing site oh um, yeah that's <laughs> and, very very popular yes yes and so um you know just trying to figure out how, ways that we can incorporate um some of the you know the tribal or not the tribal but the tourism um right. component with eco tourism and cultural tourism and and kind of tying that in because there's you know there'll be a staging area once it's built across um where you know, we can potentially build. Um, so there's a synergy know. here to yes. another part of your economy, which is trying to increase tourism. So you already have yes. some tourism, but this will potentially greatly increase it. If you can provide bear viewing, that's so popular. Yeah, there is some tourism. I mean, we have a couple of fishing lodges here in Angoon, but for the most part, we don't have, you know, like, um, boats coming in or the uncruises yes. or and and so um the opportunity to be able to tell our story you know because I, I listen you know with anthony malott the president and ceo of sea alaska he he described tourism in southeast alaska as a sleeping giant and um and we have the opportunity to be able to tell our story the way we want people to know our story and so we have um grant writers that we've hired to help in you know um with a library with um the um oh i'm drawing a blank the, with the library and with walking tours okay oh, and you know to be able to um tell the the true true history of the land i think that's incredible i i love that uh, as we talked a little beforehand when we were getting ready to go live so to speak I was admitting that even though I grew up in Alaska, you don't necessarily learn about other cultures, or at least we didn't when I was growing up. I think that the um, curriculum and uh, teachers are doing a better job at teaching about our indigenous people of Alaska, but it, getting this narrative out there, helping the um, non-indigenous people or descendants mm -hmm. uh, uh, to understand who was here first. I love that you're working on that. I want to go back to um, some of the more boring stuff, uh, but specifically, because this is actually really serious, the funding for this project, right? So one of the sources for an alternative energy project like yours is the Office of Indian Energy, but that office is like way underfunded. 
I think their annual budget is like $19 million for over 500 federally recognized tribes. Your project is, uh, I believe, $16 million? Um, it's actually, we have $7 million that we received from, you know, the state through AEA. And we still need about $13 million, And that doesn't include um, a portion that we've added on because it's really important that you have, you know, a, a large load if you're going to have the hydro up and running. And so getting all of the homes converted um, to heat pumps um, is oh. another $4 million. And so we've been working with our housing authority on that portion, but, um, but just trying to, um, trying to find, you know, the additional 13 million that we need um, to be creative, you know, cause we've, We've done all sorts of things with, um, with the, you know, the legislature, AEA, ADA, um, Denali Commission, USDA, I mean, you name it. We're like trying to be as creative as possible so that way we don't have to borrow money. Right. For the Anything that you can do for an infrastructure project in Alaska to reduce that debt is uh is huge uh mm -hmm. I, and i i'm glad that you touched on 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 those agencies that you've been in contact with because uh the whole purpose of my working on these interviews and talking to people like you is to share information with um, leaders of village native corporations and tribal leaders mm -hmm. across the state who might have um an infrastructure project and you know need to know or would be helpful to know what are some sources that you've gone to and what your experience has been like. So were you able to work with the Office of Indian Energy or has that not? Well, the, the challenge that we have is that we are a village corporation. We are a for-profit for corporation. We are not the tribe. We're not an electrical utility company. And so we have to be very creative and strategic in our thought process. The Indian energy as a source isn't available to you because you're for-profit. Is that what yes, you're saying? We, yes, we are a for-profit corporation. You know, we're a Alaska Native Village Corporation. We are supposed to be, you know, generating revenue. We're supposed to have a successful 8A company. We're supposed to have all of these different arms, but none of them have to do with being an electrical utility company, you know, like the ABCPs and the, you know, IPEX of, the, of Alaska. And, and so that, that has been our challenge and, and trying to find ways around that um, has definitely been challenging. Like I said in the beginning, you know, we were given this coupon here, go build this hydro project and good right. luck. Um, <laughs> right. And so it, and we did, we have, you know, reached out to Office of Indian Energy and there are some things that they can do. And one of the, you know, the items that they did do was, um, um, you know, looking at our load capacity and, and how it would look for the conversion of the, the homes in Angoon to be on heat pumps. Oh. And so, so the Office of Indian Energy, you know, has been somewhat helpful, but I mean, you again, we're a village corporation, we're not the tribe. And so that is challenging in itself. And, and, you know, having Indian country in Alaska versus, you know, the, the lower 48s is completely different also. And we don't meet that criteria as well. So, well, that's unfortunate. I, um, I wanted to ask you more questions, but I feel like we should touch on some of the stuff that you prepared that I know that you want to talk about. So what have I not asked you about that you wanted to share or touch on? Um, I, well, I think, you know, going back to our first question, you know, we, we do in, in this community pay 64 cents per kilowatt hour. 64 um, cents. Yes. Yes. And that so, you know, crazy. It, yes. And that's five times, you know, the average. Um, and, you know, for example, our store, our local store, per month, they are averaging um, $3,700 in their, with just their electrical bill. And, um, oh my God. And that doesn't even include like the transportation to get all the, you know, all of the produce and whatnot to Angoon. And, you know, a summer fishing lodge, um, they pay $5,500 per month um, in with their electrical bills. So, so um, the, the barrier to do business, the cost of, mm -hmm. uh, doing business there 
one of the cost of uh, part of the cost of entry is being able to afford power. So if you are able to stand up this project and drive down the cost of um, electricity, you are going to be making it much more feasible for people to start small businesses or big businesses. Well, and to expand their business or, you know, to be able to um, pass it down or not necessarily pass it down, you know, not have to pass anything down to the, you know, the people who are already paying the high rates in electricity in their own home and then having to go to the store, you know, to, to pay for more, um, to, you know, basically help them cover the, you know, their expenses and just trying to run the store and trying to keep the produce fresh and, you know, the items that you need frozen. And um, it's, exactly. it's definitely challenging. You know, I, I want to touch on something that you mentioned a little while ago, and that is uh, you were spending some time out in the country and you talked about culture bearers. So as I've been working on this series, one thing that's become really clear to me, and I, I felt this way, I had already identified the value, but I, I just want to hear what your thoughts are on this. But uh, we're talking about how expensive it is to live at home or back home, as we say in Alaska. It's expensive to live in rural Alaska to have um, power to pay for electricity, whether you're um, connected to a grid or if you're using diesel generators, as some people mm -hmm. will do. It's expensive to ship that fuel. Um, you have to buy some food, even if you do subsistence food gathering, you still end up buying food. We're paying a lot mm -hmm. for shipping in that. So I think some people might ask why then do we have people living in places where it's so expensive? And I say those, this land, I mean, it's precious, right? It's mm -hmm. ours and we need to keep it in our possession and be able to hand it to your son and his children and his children's yes. children, right? So one yes. of the things that I've been really hitting hard is these corporations, these Alaska Native corporations, not only do they need to be financially um, successful in order to pay dividends, but we need to keep them healthy and strong in order to keep the land that was passed over to them as a settlement. Um, with the U.S. government. But I just, having said all of that, uh, how do you feel about making sure people have the opportunity to stay home, to make that choice to live in Angoon rather than move to, say, Juneau? Um, I think it's extremely important. Um, you know, I, I look at this land as my, my grandfather's land, my father's land. And, you know, thankfully, when my father was alive, my son had the opportunity to tell him, I want to live here. I wish we had a home here. And even now, you know, being here and having the opportunity to go hunting, having the opportunity to go fishing, whether it be halibut, sockeye, king salmon, you know, um, having the opportunity to go pick berries, having the opportunity to, you know, just to live off the land the way that our ancestors did. And and knowing that we, you know, we own the land and knowing that it's more valuable than we could ever possibly imagine. Because we, right. you know, between my sisters and I, we have a piece of, you know, we have my father's land mm -hmm. and there's no way in, um, there's no way that we would ever, ever sell it. And, right. and I feel badly because, you know, we have um, this airport project coming in and several of our shareholders have land around that, that site and they will have to sell their land. And, and so I was, you know, we're trying to figure out ways to, to give them a different piece or have them be able to trade. Well, Melissa, it's been so great talking to you and I know we can talk for much longer and hopefully in a post COVID world, you'll come and speak at the uh, Norton Sound uh, Regional Economic Summit, which hopefully will happen in 2021. But as we complete, I just want to make sure that we have recapped and, and touched on all that this project means to Angoon. Uh, what were some of the other things that we didn't uh, hear about yet? I know you, you've said something before about electric cars. Yes, I, I was, you know, I was going over this last night with my son because I, I went over notes that I had from a previous speech that I, or, you know, presentation that I gave. And one of the things that I had said to them was that, you know, we we want the problems 
that people who have these 100 year old hydros have. Like I want the problems in, our, in my community that Juno has, for example, with their, their hydro. I wanna be able to have heat pumps in our homes. I wanna be able to have electric cars in our driveways. I want, you know, I want those same benefits that others receive from having a hydro. And it, you know, and also more importantly, you know, moving away from diesel. Um, huge. The, yes, very, very huge. Especially in Angoon, um, the potential to offset approximately 120,000 gallons of oil per year for electric generation. 120,000 gallons. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's so many implications to that. I'm so glad we got to that because yes. I think that this is, I, I had a question which we're not gonna be able to get to, but you know, how do we get people to consider um, other options besides well, being- It's 120 for the electric generation and it's 200,000 gallons per year for heating consumption. Oh my God, and that so was total. The, the total can be anywhere between 200,000 and 650,000 per year and depending on the oil prices. And so it's huge in our small rural communities, you know, to not have that dependency and to have the opportunity for true economic development and, and, and I feel and like independence. Yes. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry to cut you off, but I just want to make sure that what I'm hearing is economic independence. Mm -hmm. Stability. Yes. You know what? This, community. this is the perfect place to end. Yay. I'm so glad that you had time to do this and I hope that everybody in your community is safe and mm -hmm. I look forward to being able to spend time with you again um, post COVID. So in the meantime, keep doing all your good work. Thank you so much for spending this time today. And I know people are going to love to hear about your project. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you.